Sister Amy and Sister Esther back in Israel. If you could see the group of people here in North Carolina out in the middle of what we would call nowhere, you'd be blessed to see the people that love you. So, anyway, so we greet you in the name of Yeshua. And um, one thing, let me just say this to you guys. I've had so many times people come up to us and they're just so happy because we're Jewish and stuff like that. But do you know, you're, if not just as much more important to Him than what we are. Because you haven't rejected Him. We did. That's a hard thing for us to deal with. My last name is actually Benun. Dinun is my father's name. And I'll just kind of give you a little bit of background on that. My father, their family, converted to Christianity by force during the Inquisition. Only part of them did. We were Binun before that. Before Binun, we were Levites. And I actually found out the Levite side not long ago because when we did the DNA test for my father's side, I already knew what my mother was, but I started seeing all these rabbis that are all over the Europe, and one of the one of them wrote me and he said, "Steve, he says your father's family, like so many of us, have changed their names and even religions for survival purposes because, as you well know, he says on your side, he says you know about your mother's side. My mother, we have thousands that died in the Holocaust. He said on your father's side, he said which is my father's as well, he said we had." tens of thousands that were killed in the Holocaust. So, but the thing is, and I'm going to start with a scripture in Zechariah. And I'm going to start there because this is, we're going to kind of go into, oh, well, I go into all kinds of areas. I have a dyslexia, so it's a blessing. I'll take you on a trip like you've never been on before. And if I don't wear you out, no telling when we'll stop. I always, I hope, if I get a little excited, I hope a shouting doesn't bother anybody. <laughs> oh, he can't stand it, can he? Oh, God bless him. <laughs> so, what they say, I'd hear in the Pentecostal people, they'd say they have an amen corner or something like that. So... Um, by the way, does anybody here know Hebrew at all? Or know some Hebrew words or a little bit? Okay, so you know in, in Israel you hear, you know, mashlam echma, you know, things like that. But in Alabama we talk Hebrew a little bit different. We say mashlam cha. At the ambassador. Rabbis like that if I use southern Hebrew for them. Uh, I'd like to go to Zechariah 12. It's a familiar uh, chapter, and we're going to go to verse 10. He says, I will pour upon the house of David and upon the inhabitants of Jerusalem, that's Jerusalem, the spirit of grace, of supplication, and they shall look upon me whom they have pierced. Now, most rabbis will tell you that the word there in Hebrew means thrust through. It doesn't actually mean pierced. But I'll tell you in a minute why. And so it still does. It's applicable regardless if it's pierced or thrust through. We think of pierced because of his hands and his feet. But actually what brought you redemption was when the Roman soldier thrust the sword into his side or the spear into his side. That's what released in, in symbolism, you would, we would say, that's what released the Spirit of God from him. Now, that's only symbolic. Okay, we'll go into that tonight. So anyway, so if you ever deal with a Jewish person and, and you try to use this scripture and you say to him, you know, say, well, you know, the Bible says right there, you're going to look upon him whom you pierced. And you'll say, well, what Jesus, was he not piercing his hands and his feet? And they're going to tell you real quick, like, it doesn't say pierced. So if you ever confront a Jew and you want to use a scripture on them, you tell them, say, it's thrust through, I agree. Say, did not, did that, didn't, that, didn't that happen on Calvary when the Roman shrubbed that sword into his side? And what happened? Water and blood come from his side. 
Remember the woman at the well? When Jesus spoke to her, He says, if you knew who it was, He said, bring me a drink. She said, you're a Jew, I'm a Samaritan. We don't have any dealings with one another. He said, if you knew who it was that was talking to, you'd ask me for a drink and I'd give you water. You don't have to come here to drink anymore. Is that right? You know what He was showing her? He's given her a sign. And this is the way God deals with me being Jewish. He's been unraveling all these signs that are hidden in there that for Jews, we can understand it. For Gentiles, it's a blessing, but for us, it begins to make us realize who the Messiah really is. So, but anyway, so when he, when he told her about that water, see, she could go back and look to the story of Moses. When the children of Israel came out, we call him Moshe. When Moshe came out of the out of the wilderness, you know, it's only two weeks. They'd only been two weeks in the journey after the Red Sea crossing, and then they started murmuring and complaining because they're getting thirsty. They ain't got no water to drink, and they're dying. You know, God had to allow them to get to that place because He's trying to get Israel to learn something. And by the way, the 40 years that we spent in that wilderness, you remember that little scripture where Jesus it talks about He was went into the wilderness for 40 days and 40 nights and was tempted? And the other little passage that says He was tempted in all manners such as we are or we were, He experienced what Israel experienced for 40 years in a wilderness journey. That's the same wilderness He went to. That's why you see the part about turning these stones to bread. See, they got out there and they hungered too and they thirsted. He went through all the exact same thing that Israel did in that journey for 40 years. So anyway, Moses, they get this big argument whether or not God's among them or not. That's kind of ironic. Here Yeshua is on the earth and they can't figure out who He really is. Same argument. Is God really among us or not? because the Romans are there and they're taking over the land. But what the funny thing is, is what happens? I'm going to turn my volume up, brother, for you back there. <laughs> oh, good. <laughs> All right. So anyhow, what happened on that was when they got to arguing whether or not God was among them, because two weeks, I mean, you guys, if y'all saw the Red Sea parted two weeks ago, y'all would still be on fire, boy. You know why? Because you have inside of you what Israel longed for but did not have. And that's the Spirit of God. And that's what God was showing at that rock. What He did was He told Moses, He said, take you and the elders of Israel and go out there and smite the rock. Now we're not talking 38 years later. Most Christians know the one where God tells Moses, speak to the rock, that it bring forth its waters. The first time He didn't say, speak to the rock. He said, go smite the rock. The reason He said the second time, speak to the rock, was because Yeshua was to be smitten only once, Amen. not twice. But he says to him, go out there and smite the rock that it bring forth its waters. And when they went out there, why did he take the elders of Israel? Because God knew that 1,500 years later from that point there that he was going to send his own son down and that he was also going to be judged and that the elders of Israel were going to smite him. And so when they smote that rock, that rock literally split open. And water just gushed out of that rock. What was that? What was it? it? God was giving Israel a sign. Now all the ones that were complaining, had they not drank water from that rock, they would have died. They had to drink. It's the same thing today. If Israel does not accept the rock, they're going to die. No matter how much I love them and they're my people. And by the way, their eyes are just blind. Now there's some like myself. I was lucky. I didn't get raised in a strict Orthodox Jewish family. We was just a bunch of renegades. You know, as Grandma said, Grandpa and all them died with their boots on, fighting and stuff like that. And all the way up to my mother, they wouldn't go to a church or anything. In fact, when I was on my way here, I stopped by the church I got saved in when I was seven years old, my mother always said she made one mistake in her life. She visited a church with, my, with her, her best friend. 
and that was called London Baptist Church in Castleberry, Alabama. And I stopped there on the way here, and I left a little note for them. And I said, I just want to leave a thank you note for the pastor that made an altar call because a little Jewish boy came in there one time, and I didn't get to see a church again until I was a grown man because we didn't go to churches. And so when I did go and later in life, but that's where I, I got saved was that night. And that was the last time we went to church until I was about 16. So anyway, though, the, the rock was smitten and the water came out of that rock. And that was representing Mashiach, is representing Christ. Most all you guys used to those Hebrew names in here? Anybody not? All right. So I, I use kind of both because you know, one second, I run over this rascal. Okay, I got a marker in there. Good. So anyway, so when he was when when the rock was smitten, it was showing that Christ was going to be smitten. Now, before going any further, I had somebody ask me a little while back, and I repeat this a lot in a lot of the stories. They say, you know, they always why do y'all always think y'all are the chosen people? You watch enough movies and everything, they all you hear the Jews say in there, God, we know we're the chosen people, but can you choose somebody else for a little while? Well, the Jewish people are, were not chosen because we were better than anybody else. We were only chosen to be a priestly nation. Hallelujah. Our job was to offer sacrifices unto God. That included Yeshua. When God was testing Abraham, and He said to him, first He gave him a son, impossible to have, but He gave him and Sarah the child. Yitzhak, Isaac, we call him Yitzhak. Yitzhak means he laughs. So you know when Sarah laughed in the tent behind when God was standing there in a human body talking with him. See, God never held that to Sarah's charge. He held it to Abraham's charge because you know who laughed first? He did. When God had told him earlier, you're going to have a son by Sarah. Now see, by the way, the only... Here's a, here's a funny thing. When sin came into the world, the only one that... The first mistake that was made was when Eve reasoned with God's Word. That was the only mistake she made. And she did it, got deceived into doing that. It wasn't intentional. And see, Adam, though, he knew what he was doing, he did it anyway. Now, so when God is going to bring about redemption, because that's what we're talking about tonight is redemption, in order to restore everything back, God is looking first for a woman that will believe Him. Sarah should have, but God knew that she wouldn't because it wasn't time for the Messiah yet. So when He comes down, the three strangers come down. In Hebrew it says Melchim, which is angels, but not angels with wings. You know, it was just, that's why the Bible said they were strangers. They, they just look like what you would look like. They come down there and but something, Abraham knew something was different about these guys here. And of course, when the one knew the secrets of the heart there, which according to when Moses wrote it, he writes God's divine name, yod heh vav He writes that divine name inside of the Torah. So we know that inside of one of those men standing there was God Almighty Himself. And He's the one that asked the question, why did Sarah laugh? Saying, how can these things be? See, it was disappointing for God because see, God is He's wanted that relationship restored that was in the Garden of Eden that He had with Adam and Eve. They had a one-on-one -on -one relationship with God. It wasn't that Adam was the boss and Eve was the little sidekick. You know, when God said that she would be Ezra or Ezer, Kani Gedor, He's saying that it's the only, there's one time he uses the word that he calls her a help. Actually, in Hebrew, the word doesn't mean corresponding. It's just the best way we know how to translate it. It actually means against him. And as some of the rabbis interpret that, they say that, in other words, when he starts to go one way, she kind of pushes against him, and they finally come to a mutual agreement to something. That's really the way it balances out. But see, the thing was, is even when the fall comes, what does God say, say to, her, to, to, to her? He says, 
No, you have it. Your desire will be to your husband. I think that's how King James translates that. It's a bad translation. He said, you will turn to your husband. And in Hebrew, it's teshuv techa, the way the word is written there. It's an ancient Hebrew expression. It shows that she had her own relationship with God herself. Now some people, I know even the rabbis, they'll argue, and I like to get, I get them with this one here. They'll say, well, Steve, you know, you know though that, that she, what she did wrong was she said that God has said and God didn't say anything to her. I said, if, if she broke God's commandment by saying something God didn't say, God would have dealt with her on that. He doesn't deal with her on that issue. There's no, so therefore, she's not broke a commandment of God. But see, God knows what happens. See what it is. It's very interesting. Ooh, do we have a marker or anything around here? If we don't, it's okay. If you get one, I'll, I'll, I'll do this here real quick for you. A marker would help you guys see it a little bit better. I, got, I do have a pen, but just in case we have a marker. If not, I'll, I'm going I'm to explain it to you, and then I'll, then, then, okay, great, we have one here. Thank you, sister. This is what God called Adam. Ish. It's Aleph Yod Shin. I'm not doing the vowels. I'm used to it without the vowels. Okay? Now, this right here, the Yod in the middle, that's the beginning of God's divine name. Then if you take the Yod and you pull it up here to the top, you have Aish. Aleph and Shin. And Aish means fire. So his name is a compounded name. It means the fire of Hashem. For Jews, we say Hashem. I know some people will say Yahweh, Yahweh, or Yahweh, all kinds of pronunciations, Jehovah, whatever it may be, for God's divine name. The reason why we don't say it is because in the commandments for us, and I'm, I'm not against anybody that tries to pronounce it, it's okay with me, but in the commandments it says, Take not the Lord thy God's name in vain. And the, the thing about it is for us, though, when he says that, in other words, if we're trying to pronounce it and we don't know how to say it right, it's taking his name in vain, so we don't, we don't try to pronounce it. And in Zephaniah, he promised that he would restore a pure language that we might be able to call upon his divine name. And he tells us when that's going to happen. When Israel is once again surrounded by armies and it looks like we're going to be annihilated. This is the hour he restores the name. I've kind of thought maybe perhaps when the two witnesses come. Because you know, of course there's all kinds of ideas who they are, but regardless, whether it be Elijah, Enoch, Moses, I think Elijah and Moses, but all three of them knew God's divine name. So anyway, let me show you what he called Eve. He did not call her Eve. He called her Isha. Again, the word Esh, fire, right there. The second letter to God's divine name. And actually, if you put the yod hey, you have yah. Now, we can say that. So, what happens if you take God out of the equation or out of the marriage, is what we say as Jews in, in, in marriage counseling, you have nothing left but aish, which is a consuming fire and will destroy the marriage if there's no God in your, in your marriage. What did they have? They had the Holy Ghost. That's exactly what they had. Okay? And the ironic thing about it is, when the fall comes... Something happens. If God is telling Isha, he's not calling her Eve. Eve comes after the fall. And the reason being is because children are still to be birthed. So he calls her Chava, the mother of life. But the thing is, you see, God, he gave a promise, just like the animals, multiply and replenish the earth. He said the same thing to man and woman, multiply and replenish the earth. All right. Now the thing is, is he never took away the command, but what happened is the Spirit of God, the Holy Ghost, is lost because of the fall. This is why he says to her, he says to the woman, he says, you shall to shotecha, you will turn to your husband. Why? Because that relationship between her and God is broke. It's broke between him and God as well. That's why he also says, and he will rule over you. It's not a divine decree. It's a result of sin. It's a resu He's prophesying. God is prophesying. Everything he says. Then he says to her, Teladim banim. You will birth sons. Now we read in the translation, you will bring forth children in sorrow and in pain. 
it doesn't actually say that. That's just, see, carnal translations to English kind of gets things a little bit mixed up. But he actually says to her, you will birth sons and you will bring these children forth. It will cause you sorrow and pain. Now, and the funny thing is though, when you, to try to make this simple in the translation, the serpent is the one that causes that. It's because of his shrewdness and craftiness. It literally causes her to bring forth her children. Why is she going to bring forth them in sorrow and pain? Because one, the Holy Spirit is lost as a result of sin. If the Holy Spirit wasn't lost back then, there would be no need for Yeshua to come and die on the cross. Okay? That's why the redemption is needed. It's because something is lost. See, there's a reason for it. And so, with the Spirit of God being lost in their life, you know, not to say they don't have life. I mean, they still have the, the carnal life, and there's still the promise of redemption. In fact, God Himself offers a lamb. He sacrifices two lambs, one for Him and one for her, and He covers them in those skins. So He gives a blood atonement, a temporal sacrifice, until the full atonement can be made, and they would, once again, the Spirit of God could come back upon them. All right, now, I didn't actually intend to go into this, but we'll get back into the other part in a minute because it's still all the same. I'm going to take you into Genesis real quick. Let me just... Um, all right, in chapter 2, I would tell you verse 9, but that won't help you any. I think it's verse 7 in English. Ve'itzer Adonai Elohim et ha'adam afar min ha'adama. So he's talking, he's talking about that he has, formed, he has formed the man from the dust of the ground. Then he says here, ve'ipach be'epav. And he's breathing into his nose. Bepach. Bepach means he's breathing. God is breathing into him and into his nose. Nishmat chayim. The very soul of life. The chayim is the important part. The chayim is God's own life. He breathed into them. Now, I say them, and the reason why I say them, remember the Bible said he created them, male, or male and female created he them. But yet there's only one body there. Everything about redemption, who you are today, is right there in that story. See, when he created them, it's because Eve was inside of there. And the mere fact that God says that he breathes life into Adam's nostrils, into the Adama, the ground, or Adam, Ha'adama is the ground. That's why he gets the name Adam. Adam comes from Ha'adama which the feminine part is the ground, the earth. So he creates him, but he breathes ipach, into the nostrils. But he doesn't breathe. He sh if, he was only gonna, if it was only Adam by himself there, God would have had to say, nishmat chai. Singular. Now it does say in, in a singular, it says he becomes a living soul, just him by himself, as far as that body. But when he breathes in there, he does it chayim because his wife's in there. Where do, you think you, where do you think your life was when Yeshua walked the earth? It was in Him. The part of you that will bring you back to Him, that will draw you to Him, the part, that part of you, that life that Adam and Eve had in the garden was inside of Yeshua when His feet were walking this earth. You see, he was that tree of life. He even says it. He says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. In Hebrew, Chaim. There were two trees in the midst of the garden, the tree of knowledge of good and evil, Tovera, Eitz Tovera. See, that's the tree of good and evil. And then there was the tree of Eitz Chaim. Just like you read it in English, the tree of life, and in English, I think it says he breathed life. But see, it's hard for you a little bit in English because the word life can be singular or plural, either way. But in Hebrew, it's not like that. It pluralizes that word. So when he breathed, ipach, 
into that nostril, he breathed life, he put more than one, chayim, in there. And what, so therefore, how did they partake of the tree of life? It was a free gift. Isn't that what Christianity is based on? A free gift? It's not by works. It's nothing you can do yourself. It's a free gift of God. Nowhere do we find any place in the Torah where they went and partook of this tree. They didn't have to. God gave it to them freely. He breathed. Ipach. He breathed. Nishmat Chaim. He breathed that very life of God and they became living souls because of that. Now, when you think about Yeshua saying, I am the way. All this is it's so simple for Jews. If, if the Jews can just open their eyes and begin to see this, it makes sense. And you'd be surprised how many people in Israel will be watching this video. It'll be hearing you guys right here in North Carolina. I get new messages all the time. Because more and more Jews from Israel are starting to believe. And as they always say, they keep telling me, and it's such a blessing, you know, they say, Steve, when you talk about these things, it makes sense to us because we are Jews and we're Orthodox Jews and we're starting to believe that Yeshua is the Messiah and you can relate to us because you understand it the way we understand it. And that's what begins to put the pieces of the puzzle together for them. So when we look at the part about he, Jesus says, I am the way. Remember when God, when he brought them out of the Garden of Eden, Adam and Eve, and then he put the seraphims or cherubims, whatever you call it, to guard what the way to the tree of life. He said, except they put their hand forth and they partake of the tree of life and live in a fallen state, in other words. That's why he had to guard the way. And so 2,000 years ago when Yeshua is walking the earth, that must have been a big debate. They were trying to figure out, how do we get back to what we left? Why? Because they've got Rome beating down their lives every single day. Rome is in control. Rome is causing them havoc constantly. And they know if they could ever just figure out, how do we get back to the tree of life? How do we get back to it? So Yeshua says, I am the way. I am the truth. I am the life. He is Eitz Chaim. But see, it just didn't click for them yet. He was saying it more for the sake of the Jews for today that are, that are what we're about to finish reading here, wherever, whichever Bible it was, this one, I think. They're about to see this. But what you do has a big impact on what's fixing to happen to them. See, Yeshua is trying to pull in those last few Gentiles right now. He's trying to get them in, get them sealed, get them filled with the Holy Ghost so that He can turn His heart back to Israel again. Remember, He works with, He'll bring us out little bits here and there, but as a whole, He deals with our people as a nation. He's always dealt with us as a nation. All right, so here's the thing. Another quick thing before we go for, further. Where did Eve come from? God put, put him, put Adam into a deep sleep, right? Because see, God said there was so, something was not good. He does all this creation, and all of a sudden there's problems in the Garden of Eden? What kind of, I mean, for God to say it is not good for the man to be alone, something was wrong, and we just think about it, we just read it like, oh, it wasn't good in the Garden, okay, no big deal. It's not good for the man to be alone. Yeah, I can agree with that. Yep, you're right, God. See, every story you read in the Bible, if you read the story of David, the story of Joseph, you read the story of Abraham, I'll, I can take you, and I'm going to take you through a little mini track of that. Every one of these stories type who Yeshua is. He's in every story, every book, every verse. His life is there. It's all about Him. He's there. He was Joseph that was rejected of his brothers. He was Joseph that was put into the pit. He was Joseph that was sold out. And it was the Midianites, his brother John Costick, and we were down in Houston recently, and he had told me this before, and I, I couldn't remember what he had said there. He said, Brother Steve, he said it was, his brothers never pulled him out of the pit. He said it was, it was the Ishmaelites that did it. And we were looking back, and I'm like, you're right, you're right, it was the Ishmaelites. He said, of course. He said, just like the Jews. He said, the Jews, yes, they judged him. They condemned him to death. But it was the Romans that took him and put him on the cross. 
And you know, not long ago, I got to see in a dream Him on that cross. I better wait on that one. So where did Eve come from? A lot of times people say, well, Eve come, she's from the rib. God put Adam in a deep sleep and God took a rib out and He made Eve. Now, that's a big debate amongst rabbinical scholars. The Chabad Jews, which I'm a member of the Chabad uh, Orthodox Jews, which are the Hasidic Jews. A lot, there's a lot of Hasidic Jews, though. I mean, all kinds of them that wear the black and nothing else on. In fact, sometimes when I dress that way, I'm like, oh, gosh, everybody's going to think I'm still an Orthodox Jew or something. <laughs> so, but, but the thing is, is they believe that when God says that He'd taken and He opened up Basa, the flesh, that God literally taken from Adam's side, literally half that side, and He made Eve from that. That's, again, carnal thinking. But technically, the argument comes is that we really don't see where He says He'd taken her from a rib. Although Adam does say, she is bone of my bone and flesh of my flesh. And I think that's probably where that comes from. In Hebrew, God says he took her from min ish. And if you really take it literally, he took her from the very fire of God out of Adam. In other words, the very life that God had breathed inside of that body, that clay figure, the very the body of the woman, he takes from the fire of God out of that. And from there, he creates a body for her using the DNA, no doubt, of the man that he made. Okay, now all of this matters, believe it or not, it actually matters. You don't have to know it, but it does matter. Because you see, when Yeshua was on the cross, this is why he had to go on the cross to begin with. Because your eternal life, the Holy Spirit that God had for you, was in that man's body on that cross. And this is why you see in the scripture, Adam, the Bible, God says it's not good for the man to be alone. See, when Christ was here on the earth and He was with His disciples and stuff, there was a yearning inside of Him. There was a problem. He had a major problem. He loved them so much. But He couldn't have the relationship with them that He wanted. When He walked this earth, no doubt in His own mind, He knew you all the way down to this day now, he could see there was such a yearning in his life and in his heart as he walked this earth to have a completed relationship with you. But he, there was only one way for that to happen. It was the same way it was with Adam. God put Adam into a deep sleep to fix the problem. And he opened up his side. And from his side, he takes from, I mean, he's from the fire of God. And he brings that out and he deliberately forms his wife, Isha. A woman filled with the Holy Ghost. It's no strange reason why you read in the Christian Bible that John came from his mother's womb filled with the Holy Ghost. He is a type of the bride of Christ. Or the bride of Mashiach. See, this is why John was filled with the Holy Ghost. He typed Eve. So there had to be somebody born filled with the Holy Ghost because Eve come from her husband filled with the Holy Ghost. And if God is fixing the redemption story, then it, all has, it has to play out the exact same way. So Christ is in that situation where He too, something's wrong, something's going, this, it's not going the way it should go. And he knew the only way to resolve the problem, the difference between him and Adam, Adam didn't know what was going to happen. Other than he knew there was a problem, he was no doubt feeling a tremendous, I believe he felt an anguish unlike anything that we could ever imagine. He had to have felt the way Christ did when he was getting ready to go to the cross. And some people say, well, it couldn't have been that big of a deal. It had to be a big deal. God in Hebrew, the very word that he says that he put him to sleep, we, we call that a coma. That's the Hebraic word for the word coma. He put him in a coma. He comatose, like they say today, they can induce you into a coma. God had to induce Adam into a coma. So no doubt that what was fixing to happen to his human body was going to be a trauma. So we can't just say, well, no big deal. God just opened him up and took out his bride and everything was all hunky and dory. Yeshua, when he went to the cross... And he died. And what did the Roman soldier do? He took that spear 
His body was lifeless. Same thing with Adam. God had to make him nearly lifeless before he could open his side. And when he opened up the side of Christ, that Roman soldier with that spear, the Bible says water and blood come from his side, but they were separated. I believe the Samaritan woman was there that day because he said to her, if you knew who you were talking to, you would ask me for a drink of water. You don't come here anymore. He was referring her back to the rock that Moses struck in the wilderness. He was showing her that the elders of Israel will have to come out. They will have to judge me. They will have to smite me. I will be hung on a pole as the brass serpent was hung on the pole showing that sin would be judged. And then unless you look, if you didn't look, if you didn't believe it when you saw it, you would not live. And the thing was, was when that water came out, it was a sign, it was an open sign to Israel that their rock was on the cross. And that life was able to come out. The Holy Spirit that he carried, the tree of life that he was, now came out. This is why he went to his apostles after the resurrection and he breathed upon them and he said, Receive ye the Holy Ghost. Thank you, Father. He was showing Israel the same God that breathed on Adam's body, that clay figure on the ground that breathed life into it, that that tree of life was walking among them once again. This is why you read on the day of Pentecost in the Christian Bible, there were cloven tongues like a fire. It was the ash. But it was God in that fire. That's why there were cloven tongues like a fire that rested upon each one of them. What they, see, every child that was born, you were born in the world. Even Abraham and all of them, they had the promise. And they believed that promise, but they never received it. In fact, that should, that should really sink home for, the, for, the, for those that, that, that question the idea whether or not when, when you have, for example, there, there, is a, there is a belief that the Jews for the last 2,000 years are all lost. I had a man tell me this one time, and he's a supporter of Israel. He loves the Jews. And he sent me a letter and he said, Steve, he says, how can you believe that Jews for the last 2,000 years that, he said, every one of those Jews that died, they all went to hell. I said, and you support Israel? How could you say that they all died? And they're all, as he put it, they died and went to hell. He said, they never believed on Jesus Christ. I said, the thing is, is you don't know enough about Jesus to know what he did. His own words were to the Jews when he was here, if you were blind, you would have no sin. When my forefathers, this is what hard is hard for me. When they cried, that was my family that said, let his blood be upon us and our children. It was my father's family that condemned him to death. But when we were crying out and saying, let his blood be upon us and our children, we meant it for evil. When Joseph's brothers took and they, they were, you know, the thing is, is when they, when they, when they're finally coming to their senses, when Joseph hasn't revealed himself to them, but they're around him. Just like now, we're in our homeland. Joseph, Yeshua is around us. He's the one that moves some of those bombs out of the ways for us, just so that we'll realize something, that God's presence is among us. He was the one that took care of 1967, because he knew it wasn't time yet. There's your four angels that stand and say, hold everything back until I've sealed my servants. They've never received the Holy Ghost because they can't see it yet. And the only reason they can't see it is because he's, we're waiting for you to find your position. You have to recognize that you are called to be the sons and daughters of Almighty God. If you've got loved ones, remember, you're like Rahab. There's coming a battle very soon. And when God comes down, when Joshua comes, in Hebrew we say, Yeshua. Just like you say about Yeshua. Yeshua. 
when Joshua crossed that river, isn't it funny that none of the children of Israel were circumcised for 40 years? Circumcision is a type of the Holy Ghost. And during the, when Israel, when they first came out, God commanded Moses, take and circumcise all the men that were in Egypt. And so when they came out, they were circumcised. But while they were in their wilderness journey, all those original men died. Not one except Caleb and Joshua. Those were the only two that made it from the beginning to the end. And all their sons that were born, not one son was circumcised. You know why? It was showing that Israel during her diaspora, during the time from Yeshua until the time they recognized Yeshua, would never receive the Holy Ghost. That's what he was showing. Remember when he said, your fathers ate man in the wilderness? He says, I am that bread. See, he has supernaturally sustained Israel for 2,000 years while he dealt with the Gentiles. So that he could, because see, Abraham was a father of many nations. And you and your families, some of you probably German, Finnish, no telling whatever more from different parts of the world. God loved you just as much. But he had to have this one little group of people that could offer up a sacrifice. That's what he was trying Abraham for. He wanted to see, was it in his genes? Did he have the genealogy? Did he have the ability to offer up his only son? That was the test. He wanted to see, were you the people that I could trust to be the priestly nation that when I send my son, you will have the ability to offer him up? See, Abraham did it blindedly too, didn't he? He had no idea why God was doing this to him. It was never revealed to him why. And so he blinded Israel so she would not know either. Because had he not blinded her, she would have never offered up Jesus on that cross. And then had she not done, had Israel not done that, then we wouldn't be here today. The Bible says, if you sow the wind, you reap a whirlwind. In Hebrew, it literally means if you plant, if you plant that seed, that, that wind is the ruach. If you bury the Holy Ghost, You'll, re you'll reap a whirlwind. Yeshua was filled with the Holy Ghost. And God already told us what would happen and we took Him and we put Him in a tomb and, we, and the Romans sealed it. And because of what we've done, we have reaped the whirlwind. We had to pay the price because there's a law for that. But that's, what's ha that's what had to happen. At any rate, though, you were in Him. And so He was trying to bring it out. Let me finish this verse here in Zechariah. I'll just start it over. And I will pour upon the house of David and upon the inhabitants of Jerusalem the Spirit of grace and of supplication. Actually, if you read verse 7, let me just read that one real quick. The Lord also shall save the tents of Judah first, that the glory of the house of David and the glory of the inhabitants of Jerusalem do not magnify themselves against Judah. You know what that means? The house of Israel is Jerusalem in this case here. They were not there when Yeshua came. It was only the house of Judah. That was the only ones there was the house of Judah. Three tribes. The tribe of Benjamin, the tribe of Judah, the tribe of Levi. And of course the Samaritans were there as well. Half Jew, half Gentiles. Those were the remnants from the Syrian invasion that raped the women that were there and they brought forth children. And by the way, Jesus recognized them as Jews because their mothers were Jews because of the women that were raped by the Syrian army. 
So it's kind of funny. The Orthodox Jews, we made this rule up during the Holocaust because so many men were killed and we were afraid that our people would be wiped out unless we accept that the mothers are Jewish. And I like to point that out to the rabbis just to poke fun at them. I say, I like the fact that you keep Jesus' word. Yeshua, y'all are obeying Yeshua's word. He recognized the mother to be the Jew as well. And so that's the case there. So anyway, the reason why it says that they do not get lifted up, in other words, right now what's in Israel today is the house of Judah. He brings the house of Judah home first because he has to deal with our forefathers. We have, we have to deal with the issue of what we did 2,000 years ago. Now he did say that all 12 tribes will be there. So what's going to happen here very soon when the 70th week of Daniel starts and I don't even, I can't say that it hasn't started. Maybe it has. I don't know the answer to that. But when I saw that Rome, when the Catholic Church could do communion at the tomb of David and throw the Jews out, that's a serious situation. The Bible clearly says in, in your Bible, in the Christian Bible, in Revelation 11, it talks about, John says that he took a reed like unto a rod and he measured. He said, measure the temple, measure the altar, leave out the outer court. It's going to be given to the Gentiles. And they're going to tread the holy city underfoot for 40 and two months. That's three and a half years. Okay? That's the Gentiles. He's not talking about the Palestinians. No. Palestinians have been there a lot longer. Rome has been wanting control of Israel. And the thing is, is although I don't like it, God is resetting the stage like it was 2,000 years ago. See, when... When Yeshua was here 2,000 years ago, those that did believe Him, we wanted to be delivered from the Romans. That's what we were hoping for. We knew that the Bible says that the government rests upon His shoulder. We we're looking for a warrior. That's why today a lot of Jews expect that the Messiah comes through the government. Someone that will have the courage to kick out the Palestinians, burn the Dome of the Rock, and set up the Third Temple, and this is going to be the glorious thing. Unfortunately, it will not happen the way we think. There will be a third temple, but of course, that Gentile Romans are the ones that really want it there. The Vatican, the Vatican does. Amen. Exactly. This is why you see in right now, when he says, let me flip through that real quick, because I, I think it's important. There's a little key, couple of key things there. If I wear you out, just tell me. I'll, I don't know when to shut up sometime. Okay, verse 2 in chapter 11 of Revelation. But the court which is without the temple, leave out and measure it not, for it is given unto the Gentiles. And the holy city shall they tread underfoot forty and two months. Alright, now, by the way, the next verse speaks about the two witnesses. I will give power unto my two witnesses, and they shall prophesy a thousand two hundred and three score days, another three and a half years clothed in sackcloth. These are the two olive trees, that's in Zechariah, the two candlesticks, standing before the God of, of the earth. And if any man will hurt them, fire proceedeth from their mouth. I don't think that's a literal fire. I think it's kind of like it was with Elijah. You know, when, the, when they came up there disrespectfully, the 50 soldiers, and said, you've been commanded to come down to see the king, King Ahab. He says, if I be a man of God, let fire come down and destroy all of you then. In other words, it's whatever they say. God will back it up. So it doesn't matter how big, how modern they think their armies are. Let them bring it on. I feel sorry for the guys that deal with them. Well, no, I don't feel sorry for them. I'll probably be the cheerleader. <laughs> Burn another one, boy. Come on. All right. So anyway, but the thing is they tread the holy city. The holy city underfoot for 40 and two months. It also says in another place that they give, that they, they take over Mount Zion. Well, Mount Zion is where what is called by the Christian people, the upper room is on Mount Zion. See, Mount Moriah is where the temple sits, but Mount Zion is to the farther, uh, to the far uh, eastern, what is it? No, no I'm sorry. This, that's the southern side of the city. That's Mount Zion. That's where the tomb of David is. That's where when the Pope goes over there and he has, a, he has his little communion service there in the, in the upper room, and then the following week, they sent the Israeli special forces in and they threw the Jews out of King David's tomb, and the Vatican came in there and they did a communion service in there as well. That's a prophecy in the Bible. I wish I remembered where that was. I did a video on that a little while back, not too long ago actually, where it says about they would take and they would drink wine on his holy hill. 
saying? See, Rome is re-getting their, they're getting that control all over again. Why? Because God said, okay, we wanted to be delivered from the Romans. Well, no problem. We get what we asked for. So he brings the Romans back so we could get under occupation again. And he's going to deliver us from them. And so a third temple will be there. Now, it's not Ezekiel's temple. The temple mount's not big enough for Ezekiel's temple. But they're going to build a temple. And Rome is going to help them build that temple so that they can disgrace it in the end, according to Daniel's prophecy. Okay, so let's go back to Zechariah. I've got to use glasses. It's all blurry. Chapter 12. Ooh. Chapter 12, verse 2. I turned to a different book. Okay, here we go. Going back to verse, uh, we'll go to verse 11 now. Oh no, let me, I st I'm still in verse 10. Halfway. Look upon me whom they have pierced or thrust through, and they shall mourn for him as one mourneth for his only son, and shall be in, in bitterness for him as one that is in bitterness for his firstborn. In that day, shall there be a great mourning in Jerusalem as in the mourning of Hadron, excuse me, Hadr, Hadr, Had, Hadarim, uh, excuse me, Hadarimon, I can't see it very well with this here, and, and in the morn, uh, excuse me, and in the valley of Megiddon, and the land shall mourn every family apart, the family of the houses of David apart, and their wives apart, the family of the house of Nathan apart, and their wives apart, the family of the house of Levi apart and their wives apart, the family of, of Shimei apart and their wives apart, and all the families that remain, every family apart and their wives apart. Now, interesting, why does it always say their wives apart? That is showing you that it's going to be Orthodox Jews that are going to be believing. That's our custom. When we mourn, we separate. Doesn't mean it's the right thing to do, but it's just our custom. It's what we're used to doing. But what's interesting though, he mentions the house of Judah, the house of David, the house of Levi, and the house of Shemai. David and Nathan, I'm sorry. David, Nathan, Judah, Shemai. I think that's right. Yeah, David and Nathan are both from the house of Judah. Okay? That's where they're from. The Levites, we know, are the priests. They're from the tribe of Levi. Uh, Shemai is from the tribe of Benjamin. And the families that remain were the Samaritans. So he's resetting the stage. We don't see the house of Israel here yet because, of course, in verse 7 there, he said that he would gather the house of Judah first. Because why? We have to deal with what our ancestors done. Now, that's actually hidden in the Torah. When Joseph, when he's getting ready to reveal himself to his brethren, it's kind of interesting because, you know, when they throw him in the pit, you know what's really funny? Reuben is the only one that's trying to cry out for Joseph's life. Reuben's name means behold a son. Reuven. And so every time they would argue with him, they kept saying, behold a son, behold a son, behold a son, and they don't get it. The son is being thrown into the pit. But he wants to save his life. And while he's gone, this evil befalls Joseph. Joseph, we know, as he's sold out, he goes down into Egypt. He's sold into slavery. Just like Jesus was sold for 30 pieces of silver, Joseph was sold for 20. He, we, know, we know all the stories that they, that's known in Christianity is, uh, from the scholars that have studied this, that like the two thieves, uh, the butler and the baker, one was condemned, the other made it to life and everything. But what's really interesting, though, is that some of the things that I picked up on watching this story was when they're on their way back, and they're, they're, the first time they go down, he gives them a hard way to go. He binds Simon. By the way, Simon's name in Hebrew, Simeon, means heard or hears. So he binds him and puts him into the prison, showing that Israel's hearing would be, would be bound and they would not be able to hear. Okay? And he says, I will not, I will not believe you unless you bring your youngest brother, Benjamin. You've got to bring him back. If you bring him, then I'll believe your story. So they go back, and on their way back, they stop at a hotel, the word in Hebrew, Malone, which means hotel. And when one of the brothers goes to feed his donkey, he opens his bag, and his money's in there, and he's scared to death. Why did it happen there? Because the first place we rejected him was when he was in his own mother's womb. 
when Yeshua was in his mother's womb and Joseph is trying to find a proper place for his wife, Mary, to have this child. And when they came to the hotel, or the inn as you have in English, we rejected him there. It was a Jew that was rejecting him. So therefore, that's why you see the story in Joseph. Everything is typing him out. When they come back the second time, they finally bring Benjamin. Now when Benjamin comes, now Yeshua is having a very difficult time. Or excuse me, Joseph is having a difficult time. Just like Jesus, as Yeshua sees Israel in her homeland, he's having a very difficult time containing himself because of his love for Israel. Now when I say Israel, remember, not everybody over there that says they're Jews, that's not what he's looking for. He's looking for that remnant of Israel. Hallelujah. It's not all those that are in there that are Jews. We got a wicked Shimon Perez, which is nothing but the son of Ahab. Remember, God even said, he swore. Elijah was told to go tell Ahab all this evil that's going to come upon him. And when Ahab turned with sackcloth and ashes and repented before the Lord, God said to Elijah, go back and tell him. I, look, he said, look at the way he's, what he's doing, the way he's repenting. God says this to Elijah. Eliyahu is how we call his name. Eliyahu. He says, go back and tell him I'll spare his life. He said, I'll bring everything that he did upon his son. And now what, what was the sin of Ahab? He married Jezebel and brought idolatry into Israel. What did Shimon Peres do in 1993? He went and married Rome and brought Rome into Israel. And Rome owns 60% of the land of Israel this, to this day. Talk about splitting the marriage down the middle. He gave the woman the better half in this case. And that's no disrespect to, to, to sisters. That's just, it's, it's, it's a spiritual matter here. It has nothing to do with the physical. It's spiritual. And so Shimon Perez has brought that evil into our country. Now, so anyway, so what does he do there? He, he brings that in. Now, Joseph, though, when, when his brothers come back and they bring Benjamin... He's almost ready to reveal himself, but not quite yet. He has another sign that he wants to fulfill. God wants to fulfill it. Joseph really has no idea why. So Joseph takes and commands that his cup be put in Benjamin's back. Now Benjamin is the innocent brother. He's not done anything wrong. He was not conspiring in the supposed death of Joseph. But he puts, they put, he puts his cup in their bag and he sends them on their way and then he sends, says to his servant, he said, go overtake them. And when he overtakes them and he goes from the, from the eldest all the way to, to, to the least to Benjamin, to the youngest, and he opens all their sacks looking for this cup and of course they're saying, whoever did it, let him be the bond servant. He says, okay, we'll, we'll take that at your word. When he gets to Benjamin, there's the cup. And they, they tear their clothes. Now they're really, they're, they're mourning and they're weeping. In fact, when they, the funny thing was, on the first time around when they were in the prison, all of them, when he throws, he throws them in the prison for three days. Isn't that interesting? God said to Israel that for three days we would be scattered as a people, starting with the tribe, uh, the house of Israel, all the way to this day, Hosea's prophecy. In the third day, I'll gather them again. See, three days, and three days... They were spent in that prison. And while they were in their prison, they were saying, did not, they were arguing, didn't I tell you not to do this to him? The anguish we heard is cries and we didn't do anything about it. This is what's going to happen here in a very few, what, days, weeks, months from now? And Israel recognizes that Yeshua was the Messiah. Hallelujah. See, that's what we're coming up to. And Benjamin, though, the cup was in his bag. Why? Because it was the Benjamites that rejected Yeshua at the communion table. It was also showing that God knew that the tribe of Benjamin would cry out for his blood. Let his blood be upon us and on our children. Now, I didn't finish that a minute ago, so let me just finish that. When Joseph... When they threw him in that pit and they sold him out, they taken a lamb, and we'll kind of close with this one here. They take that lamb after he's gone, and they killed the lamb, and they poured the blood on his coat. They kept his coat, kind of like what happened to Yeshua. They didn't tear up his coat. They took it off of him, his cloak. But they take and they poured the blood on there. Joseph bears 
in his own body the sins of his brethren. Now you know why on Yom Kippur, why we have two lambs. One is a scapegoat. One's a sacrificial goat. They sacrifice that one goat, put the blood on his coat. They go back to their father. They said, can you discern, is this your son's coat, yea or nay? And of course, we know the story. He weeps and mourns over this. See, that's what it was. And Joseph is bearing all along the sins of his brothers in his body. Now, had God not accepted that sacrifice goat as a sacrifice for their sins, we would have nine less tribes today. He would have had to wipe them out. That's according to his own word. So something had to atone for their sins or they wouldn't be here later. So although they went all these years and Joseph grew up into a man, their sins were covered. The same thing with Israel 2,000 years ago when they said, let his blood be upon us and on our children. They meant it for evil, but God, if he had not applied that blood to their lives as a pardoning, then he would have had to wipe them all out. But that doesn't mean that all the Jews that were bad and, and did evil things and cheated and lied and steal, that they're going to make it. No. But there's a remnant. When Paul says all Israel shall be saved, he's talking about a remnant of Jews through every age. The ones that, because they were blind, but if God knows if they didn't have the blinders on, they would believe him. He knows who they are. And they were trying to keep his word the best they knew how. That's why you see in the fifth seal the souls that were crying, How long, O Lord, do you avenge our blood? Do you know of any Christian, a true Christian, that would cry out for vengeance? Jesus never cried out for vengeance. He said when he was on that cross, that's how you know also that they didn't get judgment. He said, Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. That was a blanket pardon. You know, they don't know what they're doing, Lord. All right, so therefore, that's also why the wilderness journey, 40 years, he sustained them with manna. Supernaturally, they were sustained. When they crossed the river Jordan, then he circumcised all the sons and the manna ceased. When the circumcision came, which was a type of the Holy Ghost, when they received the Holy Ghost, when the Holy Ghost was going to be poured out here in Israel in the very near future, then that time is over. All that supernatural time where God has sustained Israel and has kept them alive so that He could deal with the Gentiles. So He could fill your children and your grandchildren and your mothers and fathers and your brothers and sisters with the Holy Ghost. He had to, he had to supernaturally sustain them because His Word had already said He'd blind them. You know, when you make the prayer, Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be Thy name. You know what you're praying? Every time you pray that, you're praying for Israel to be returned to her homeland. Because when God said, Jesus asked him, how should we pray? He said, pray like this. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Sanctify your name. How do you say, how can God's name become unsanctified? That's the first question I asked. I mean, I remember when I read that, I'm like, God, I said, how, do, how does your name, how can your name be unsanctified? Because Israel's not in her homeland. God says in Ezekiel chapter 36, He said, I will gather you. He said, not for your sake, O Israel. He said, but I will go to all the countries whether it, where, wherein I have scattered you to. And I will bring you back. And I will bring you to your own land. Not for your sake. He keeps saying it over and over and over and over. Not for your sake. Not for your sake. And then God finally says, for my name's sake, I will bring you back. Why? Because it looks like God couldn't keep his word. He made a promise to Abraham and he said that I have given you this land to you and to your descendants and it is a perpetual covenant. That's a covenant that cannot end. You see, Kippah is not a perpetual covenant. That's a man-made tradition. I don't even wear one if it wasn't for the sake of my own people. They don't understand. In fact, you know why they wear one? They don't know, but I know why they wear one. You know why Jews have to wear a kippah? It is a man-made tradition. See, Abraham didn't wear one. Moses didn't wear one. I, was, I had an argument with an Orthodox rabbi one day. We were standing in the laundromat in Israel, and he says to me, he says, if I, if a kippah, where is your kippah at? I wasn't wearing it that day. And I said, I left it at the house. He said, what did you do this for? 
I said, wait a minute. I said, come on now, come on. I said, did Moses wear a kippah? He walks back and forth. No, he did not wear one. I said, what about Abraham? No, he didn't wear one. I said, okay then. What do I need to wear a kippah for? And he walks around a little bit more. Where's your tzitzit? And I didn't have it on either. <laughs> and I said, it's at the house. Yes, and don't try to say Moses didn't wear, say to wear it because you know it's a commandment of God. I said, okay, you got me. So now I wear it. If you don't see it out, it'll be in. Okay, so I wear it. He's right. So it's a perpetual covenant. God has made a covenant with our people because why? He called us to offer up Yeshua as a sacrifice. And it's not just a sacrifice. See, the thing is, is all the lambs and bullocks and everything that we have offered up, the life of that animal cannot come back upon you and give you eternal life. That was all just temporal. When he sees the blood, he passes over you. And the only way he can see the blood in your life is for his life to be in you. You have to have had to have shed. You had to have killed that lamb. You've had to take part in his death by your own sins. And then when you receive the Holy Ghost into your heart, then when the death angel comes in the land, he will pass over you because the blood is on the doorpost and on the lintel. And if that's there, he's obligated. He, he can, nothing can happen to you then. But if it's not there, then there's trouble. There's trouble. So Israel, we're at this point now. We're about to see him. The one that we crucified. I want to close in telling you something that happened to me just recently. My whole life, I wanted to see what he went through. I could go on for hours and show you in every story in the Bible. I could show you how David, I was telling you about the kippah. David, when they cross the Kidron Valley and they go up to weep over Jerusalem, do you know the Bible says that everyone covered their heads? And then they mourned over Israel. You know, David, his men said to him, if you want to fight, because Absalom, his name is Absalom, my father is peace. Isn't it funny? He should have known that his father was anointed king of Israel, but he didn't know. And so Absalom, he overthrows his father. He's a type of Israel that doesn't realize that Yeshua is the Messiah, the king of Israel. So he overthrows him in a coup. And even Jesus, pardon me, I get a hair or something there, drive me nuts. Yeshua, when he comes, he says to his people, because Peter wants to take, he's ready to fight. He pulls his sword out, he cuts off the high priest's servant's ear. Yeshua just heals him. And he said, put away your sword, Peter. He said, don't you know that I could call ten legions of angels right now? And David, his men said, do you want us to fight? They, they, these were the most valiant warriors in the world. It didn't matter if they were old or not. They were valiant men. He said, do you want us to fight? We'll fight. We'll put down this rebellion. David said, no, we're not going to fight. So they cross the Kidron Valley. They cover their heads. And they get to the top and they mourn over Jerusalem. Just like when Yeshua, he was up on the Mount of Olives and he looked back over Jerusalem. He said, oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, how often I would have hovered you as a hen with her own brood, but you would not. He said, your house is left to you desolate. Now, a lot of times we think that's the temple. And yes, the temple is a type of it. Because by the way, the temple where the Holy of Holies is, the Chodesh, Chodesh, Chodesh Chodeshim, that's how we say it in Hebrew, the Holy of Holies. According to Rabbi Orli, when I, I agree with Rabbi Orli, he said the temple was laid out like the human body. And where the Holy of Holies was is where the human heart lays. And the thing is, is that's where the Spirit of God is supposed to dwell is in your heart. And so when Yeshua says, when He stands over there, your house is left to you desolate, He's talking about He had came with the Holy Ghost to give them the Holy Ghost, but because they could not see 
who he was and because he blinded them he said your house is left desolate in other words you will not receive the Holy Ghost until Amen. see there's a little clause in that until you say Baruch Haba Amen till you say blessed is he that comes in the name of Hashem then their eyes will be opened. Then their heart will be filled with the Holy Ghost. Okay? But when David goes out, then as he leaves, Saul's son, Shemai, comes out throwing rocks at him, at David and his men, cursing them as he goes. And he spit on David. His men said, should we kill him? Oh, let, me, let me cut that dog's head off. He said, don't do it. God told him to do it. He was typing Christ. Christ was going to be spit on. Everything that you see in the Bible reflects Jesus. Every single bit of it does. And he said, let him alone. That's why you see Shemai mentioned in Zechariah. Shemai comes back to repent. Why? Because Shemai, in David's story, when David comes back, before David would even come back, he tells the two priests, which were like the two witnesses about to come, he said, get them in one mind and one accord. He said, when they're all in one mind and one accord, then I'll return. And he gets them into one mind and one accord. That's what the two witnesses are going to do with Israel. They're going to prepare the Jews to receive Yeshua. Amen. See? They get them in one mind and one accord. And so when he comes back, David, when he gets ready to cross the river, Shemai meets him at the river. And he cries out, Have mercy upon me. And his men still wanted to kill him. And David said, No man shall die this day. You see? And what is that a type of? David's men. They're, they're followers of, of the men that type Christ. That's why you see so many Christians today. They don't understand that the Jews did what they did because they had to. They were called for this purpose. And they don't understand. And so they're still willing to say, should we kill him for that? But Shemai, that's why you see him in Zechariah. That's why instead of saying the tribe of Benjamin, he says Shemai comes back. And he's asking for forgiveness. And so recently, I don't dream a lot. But I was in a dream. And the funny thing was, it was right before leaving to come on this trip. And the dream was kind of like layered. I knew I was speaking to groups like this. I could see in the dream. I could see I was getting ready to come out to speak. And it's like looking through there, like looking to another place there. And every time I look back, I saw him on the cross. I could see him from about here down. And I could see the people waiting, and I kept coming back, and I, I wrapped my arms around him. And I said, because I knew he was lifeless, and I said, he doesn't belong on a cross anymore. And as I walked up to where he was at, it's kind of like a rocky, dirty place, you know. And I walked through his blood. I could feel his blood with my feet. And it was not wet like blood fresh, but like it had been there for a while. And when I seen the blood all over him, and I just kept trying to reach around him, and I kept trying to get him off the cross. And I would look back and I could see the people. And the only thing that kept going through my mind was he doesn't deserve to be left on a cross. He deserves to be in your heart. That's what he did it for. That's what he did it for. You've got a small window, a small window open. Jesus, his own words was, until the fullness of the Gentiles be come in. Paul said the same thing. He said, Israel will be blind until the fullness of the Gentiles, in other words, the full number, for every Gentile that he knows is supposed to believe him, that he died on that cross for every life that was inside of him, the Holy Ghost, the Chaim, that he's intending to breathe upon you. Until that last one comes in, we will have our eyes blinded until that is complete. Folks, hear this. And that window is so small now. Don't let nobody go past you that you don't try to get them to see it. 
Tell your friends, tell your neighbors. If you don't have no more courage than to leave them a note, he left you a note. He left you a beautiful love letter. And he wrote it with his own blood. And the thing is, he's so desperately wants to save everyone that he can. And nobody's going to be left out. But we must do everything we can. There will be some that will be lukewarm. That when he finally is finished with the Gentiles, he'll turn to the Jews. There will be, there'll be some that will go in a rapture. You know, we were talking to Brother Austin and his family, his wife, and the friends that were here earlier about the rapture. And one of the things that I said to them, I said, I can't tell you when. I know some people say it's before the seven years, it's the middle, or it's at the end. I think the end is kind of absurd. I've always said that. What good does it do to come way back then? But anyway, nonetheless, in the story of Boaz, he falls in love with Ruth, the Moabite girl. She's a Gentile. You see, Yeshua has fell in love with you. No matter how stooped in sin you've ever been, and never look at what you've done. I know some people, they'll tell me, they'll say, Brother Steve, you know, Satan reminds me of my past. You know, when the devil comes to you with your past, won't you remind him of his? That's right. You know, he was an angel. He was in heaven. He's a great man, and he got kicked out. So, you know, ain't nobody got no right to point no fingers at you. Okay? But the thing is, it just doesn't matter how low things have been in your life. It doesn't matter what you've done. I don't care if you're, you know, becoming a Christian doesn't mean you're not going to make mistakes. It doesn't mean that you won't mess up. But there's one thing, just make sure that anything you've done, if you can make it right, make it right. That's what Shemai represented. He had done so much evil to David. But he threw himself at his feet and begged for his life. Imagine what Israel will do. See, you didn't sell him out. You didn't give him to the Romans to hang him on a cross. We did. But don't leave him on the cross either. Get him down. Place him in your heart. Renew that love, that kindle that fire that once was. You know, anyhow, if we can stand together.